going viral on the internet really mean? And why does it happen so quickly? Why is a financial institution too big to fail? How does a virus in Africa end up in the United States in a matter of hours? Why are Facebook and Google such powerful companies in creating global connections? Well, in a word, networks. But what are networks? Everyone knows about their social network, but they're all different kinds of networks you probably haven't thought about. Networks are collections of links which combine by specific rules and behave as if they are alive. We say that networks are alive because they are in constant change. Over time, the connections within a network migrate and concentrate in new places forming evolving structures. How the evolution and concentration of constantly changing connections occurs is the subject of a whole discipline called network theory. We can think of networks as neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are defined by maps. A Google map demonstrates the relationship between locations in exactly the same fashion a network connects hubs and nodes, using streets as links to connect neighborhoods. The reason a network can expand and evolve so quickly is based upon a mathematical concept called power functions. A power function is a mathematical amplification mechanism which over specific and very small ranges accelerates changes logarithmically. That is, a very small change in one parameter produces a huge change in another over a very specific range of values. An example of how network structure emerges is the algorithm used by Google. As the number of links around a search term, say friends, increases, connections begin to form among millions of different searches using the term friend. What Google has cleverly accomplished is a real-time mathematical model for how to predict the emergence of growing connections among billions of search terms. The algorithm Google derived collects the number of references to any search object. As references to a search object increase, the number of links also increases, creating a node. As the node increases in size, it eventually becomes a hub, which links to many nodes. Networks will continue to emerge as new ways of connecting and creating neighborhoods are defined. Perhaps you can begin to see why networks are so powerful. As Google continues to collect the billions of daily searches, new clusters of links will rapidly emerge, forming additional growing networks. Despite the logarithmic expansion of your network, the laws of six degrees of separation still apply. Therefore, if you explore close friends or acquaintances in your Facebook network, Everyone on average will be separated by six individuals or less, and the map of your social network will create neighborhoods linked by common connections among friends.
Innovation is such a fascinating topic, but how does it actually get adopted? Believe it or not, but in order to answer this question, we look back at a theory that was developed more than 50 years ago and it is called the Diffusion of Innovation Theory. Herbert Rogers, the author of this theory, proposed five stakeholder groups that explain how innovation gets adopted over time and by different cohorts. The first group he called the innovators. These are the 2.5% who are out there literally sleeping in front of the shop to buy the innovation the day it comes out without being road tested. The second cohort is made up of early adopters, roughly 13.5%. The early adopters are the immediate second wave. The first pass is over, the product is maturing in its abilities and the early adopters get pleasure and satisfaction out of early usage. The early majority represent the third group, that is the next 34%. The product becomes widely known and mainstream and the early majority group are those guys who ride this mainstream adoption. The fourth group, or the so-called late majority, is far more cautious. They represent roughly 34% and will wait typically for decline in pricing until first hiccups are ironed out and only then will adopt the innovation. The very tail end, the fifth and final group, consists of so-called laggards. Laggards are the most reluctant, but finally they will get over the line and make up roughly 16%. Think about laggards and those guys who only now sign up for e-banking or maybe the internet. If you map these five cohorts of the diffusion of innovation theory over time and according to these percentages, it will form a bell curve. If you now sum up this information across the bell curve, you reach the well-known S-curve. The S-curve in four stages describes how innovation is adopted in terms of the speed of adoption. At the very first stage, where there's very low growth, we see almost every startup entrepreneur on this planet. A lot of trial and error, a lot of prototyping, and many of these innovations will never see the light. If an innovation takes off, it ideally takes off in an exponential fashion. Exponential growth is what we see right now in many solutions, for example Uber and Airbnb. Rapid growth rates, and typically then we call them disruptive innovations. Once exponential growth is over, we enter the stage of slowing growth. And after that, we see a plateauing. Examples for plateauing over the last five years were analog photography or DVD players. So you can see how the diffusion of innovation theory, the five cohorts, can be mapped to the S-curve and allows us to understand who, in what sequence and at what speed adopts innovation.